Christ, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, we make a Keeper, light 
okay? Lord, we put all our attention on you right now. We want to sing to you, God. So we ask you to cleanse us. Fill us with your precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way in us through the word of God today. You might change us from the inside out. Even as we sing these love songs to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. If you want, you can. How many? God bless you. How are you doing? Everyone comfortable? Amen. Pastor Jerry wanted me to give you a message. I talked to him last night around 12 o'clock. And he told me to tell you that he loves you and that he's praying for you. And so I told him I'd do it. So there it is. The pastor loves you and he's praying for you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for a pastor that honors you and loves you and loves your word. Holy Spirit, bless them. Fill them in Jesus' name. There are creatures all around you. I know that there are lightnings and thunderings. I know that there's a storm all around you. Holy, holy, holy. I know that there are creatures all around you. I know that there are lightnings and thunderings. I know that there's a storm all around you. Holy, holy, holy. I see the seven lamps of fire burning, and I see the sea of glass mingled with fire burning. I see the son of man with thighs of fire burning, burning, burning. I see the seven. Lamps of fire burning, and I see the sea of glass mingled with fire burning. I see the son of man with ties of fire burning. Everyone 
in the temple Christ glory everyone in the temple Christ glory everyone in the temple Christ glory online or uh, chosen to stay home for whatever reason, which is fine. And we just thank God that, he, that he's allowed you to, given you that little mustard seed of faith to be here with us through even a time like this that's with everything that's going on. So it's so blessed to see you guys. It's good to see faces. It's good to be around people, be able to encourage each other. Well, if you have your bulletins this morning with you, uh, they were on your chairs I'm really not going to go through too much of the announcements. I would just encourage you to look through them. But the first thing we want to do is mention to everyone here is the prayer request. It's a slip right underneath your bulletin. Simply fill it out and then go ahead and hand it over to one of the ushers. You'll see a prayer list inside of there that we continue to be praying for uh, and have your prayer in there as well. And so we just encourage you to fill that out if you want, and if you have any prayer needs. And I know all of us have a prayer need, so. And I'll be filling that out. And then also we can see that there's just a couple of things. I'm just going to mention two of the weekly schedules that go on, and this is for the men and for the women. So on 7 o'clock on Wednesdays, we have the men's Zoom. So basically what we do is a prayer, it's a time a little, a little devo deep devotional, and then uh, we get into prayer. And so Wednesday nights at 7 is the men, and then on Thursday nights at 7 is the women. So those are the two things that we do have going on this week at the time right now. Um, hopefully and prayerfully we can be able to, when all this is said and done, things can get back to what it was. Um, and so we just encourage you to continue to be praying in a time like this. And so, so Johnny said he had a message from uh, our pastor. That's how he loves you. I have a message from Jesus. He said he loves you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come forward as we go ahead and pray for the tithes and offerings. Um, let's pray. Father, we
we just come before you. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for this church, this place, to be able to be in the parking lot to worship you, God, no matter what, Lord. You deserve it. All honor and glory goes to you this morning. Just for the life that you've allowed us to be given this morning, Father, we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, that our lives are committed to you. And so, Lord, this morning we want to recommit our lives to you once again as we continue to worship and open up our hearts to hear your word this morning. Lord, we pray for the tithes and the offerings. Lord, we just pray that you bless the giver and that you would use them to multiply and to continue the work that needs to be done here. And we thank you for it. We give all the honor and glory to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. plate goes by you. Maybe you could stand up with us. This is a sign of reverence because God's the lifter of our heads. Amen? Amen. And we look to Jesus. We look to God. And uh, 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 Jesus is worthy, amen, of all our praise and worship, all power, honor, dominion, and glory. We say amen and amen and amen, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus' name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, live for you, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show.
nation in time will put my trust in you alone and time will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show Beside you, open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken and holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes and wonder and show Please pray with me, Lord, we worship you. We give you honor, glory. We worship you. We love you, Lord. Thank you. You're a God we can trust. In. We put all our hope and trust in you. And we love you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. A little warm today, huh? But praise the Lord that he's given us another day. I want everybody to know that, and I want you guys to look at your neighbor and let them know you're a miracle. You're a miracle that you're here. You're a, it's a miracle that you get to open your eyes one more day. Amen? Amen? Because when you're in sin, it's hard to think of that as a gift, as a miracle, because the pain and the fear overtakes all that. So we lose our perspective. Before we uh, open up, I want to open up in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us another day, Father. Thank you that we can sit at your feet and hear from you, Lord. Hear the instruction that you have for us, that we may apply it, Lord. Father, we thank you for the people that you're going to put in our path so that we can tell them about your goodness, your love, and so we can also let them know what a miracle it is to be here today on this earth. Father, I pray that you bless our time, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you set me aside and that you speak through me, Father, the message that you have for your children, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you would open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 13. Now, I'm going to jump around a little bit, and you guys don't have to follow me, but you can write it down so you can... You can uh, study it yourself in your personal devotional time. And the, the title of the message is Salt and Light. When the Lord does the work in our heart, He doesn't just save us from our sin. 
He doesn't just rescue us from the addiction. Or he doesn't only restore marriages or restore relationships. But he gives us something. He inserts in us a light. A light that it needs to be, that needs to shine. A light that needs not to be ashamed of, but one that should be set above everything else so that this dark world can see it. I love how Jesus uses, uh, he uses terminology, he uses subjects that apply to us. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's using topics that are relevant to that time. And I love how he does it because he, he is, he is uh, thoughtful, but at the same time, it, it is effective. In verse 13, Jesus starts off with, you are the salt of the earth. But if that salt loses its flavor, how shall it, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now we might ask ourselves, why did Jesus use the term salt? We know that in this day and age, salt is used to... Uh, season our food, to make it taste better, so it wouldn't taste so bland. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus is talking to them about salt, because in that time, salt was more than just the seasoning of food. Salt was used for sacrifice. It was a symbolic term. Salt was used as a preservative for the putre pit putrefying of meat so that it could conserve itself a little longer. But above all, salt causes thirst. When one is thirsty, that drink of that water tastes better than anything that you've ever tasted before when you're thirsty. So Jesus used that term, salt. Now I want to go into on what salt meant in those times. In 2 Chronicles 13, 5, it says, Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt. Which meant that a covenant of salt would stand forever. A covenant of salt would be preserved forever. And would not allow for anything to destroy that covenant or pervert that covenant. Verse 12 says, Now look, God himself is with us, as our head and his priest with sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you, O children of Israel. Do not fight against God, the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. Every time that we make a promise or that we make a covenant, and it's not impenetrable, and it's not rooted in Christ, it will go bad. Why? Because for one, we're human. Two, the enemy does not like it. And he will do everything he can to putrefy that covenant. Salt was used in a, more, in a metaphorical way to signify permanence, Loyalty, durability, fidelity, usefulness, and value, and also purification. Back in 
Back in those times, salt was also used in a form of currency. The Roman soldier would either get paid in salt, or the money that, or the the, the money that that Roman soldier would receive would be to purchase salt. Because in those times, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have an ice box to put your perishables away. So it was the the your food was covered with salt to preserve it. So that so that the putrefaction process would not set in. Another example of what salt was used for in those times is in Numbers 18:19, which says, All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt. And there it is again, a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. So that salt represented a preservation. It symbolized that your promise to God can never be overridden by anything else. Kind of like your marriage vows. Your marriage vows, in a sense, need to be, that covenant needs to be offered in salt. Because your marriage needs to be preserved forever. Your marriage is, uh, uh, needs to be able to withstand the disease and the impurities that this world has to offer, that the enemy wants to insert in your marriage. Many times we hear of marriages quitting too early, not willing to go that extra step, not willing to cover yourself or your marriage with the holy word of the Lord and that promise that you've made not only to your spouse, but to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. That covenant also needs to be covered in salt for the preservation. Salt also causes thirst. And I remember this now because back before my heart was given to the Lord, I remembered how if you were to step into a bar, one of the first things they do is they give you peanuts or they give you something that's covered in salt. And it's not that they're being nice, but they're actually trying to create the thirst in you so that you continue to drink. Salt causes thirst. So if we are to be the salt of this world, then we are to satisfy that thirst for whoever is close to you. By the way you speak, by the way you react, by the way you treat others. When somebody notices something different about you, and they can't really pinpoint what it really is, but there's something different because you don't talk like everybody else, because you don't react like everybody else. And that's creating thirst for the people around you. And when they get a taste of what the Lord has to offer to them, they want more. So salt isn't just for eating, for consuming, but it's for preservation. It's for staying real, for staying true to the one that deserves all the honor and glory. Amen. Amen. And then listen, in the last part of verse 13, it says, It is then good for nothing but thrown down and trampled underfoot by men. And I was thinking to myself, okay, so what is the Lord talking about here? That when salt is no good, it, all it is is good for to be trampled underfoot. So I started studying, and back in those times, the houses 
did not have pitched roofs like, like we see here. They had flat roofs. Okay? And all your, your events that would happen at your house would happen in the roof. Because it was flat, right? And it was a, a place of meeting for your family or your company that would come over. After a while, that roof would wear out from all the traffic up there. And they would use gypsum and salt to make a, 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 a roof repair, to patch up the holes where the roof was failing. And that's what the Lord's talking about. They used salt and gypsum to be able to make a repair. It was no good. That salt was no good for nothing. The only thing that it was good for was so that we'd have a solid footing on that roof to be trampled on, to be stepped on. And I believe that that's what the Lord is talking about. When a Christian loses its flavor by his actions, his words, or his lack of faith, the salt loses its flavor. His salt loses its flavor. And so for people to receive that is of no use. That's if, that's, for example, that's like me telling you, you know, you need to give your addiction over to the Lord. You need to stay away from alcohol. You need to stay away from drugs. You need to stay away from the worldly things. But yet you see me coming out of a liquor store with alcohol. That salt that I'm producing is no good. So we need to be careful that our salt does not lose its flavor. Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. A lamp can be decorative, but the only person, the only purpose for that lamp is to illuminate the room. Jesus is telling his disciples, and he's telling us today, that light that Jesus inserted inside of you when you, when you committed your heart to him should be set on a place where it can be seen. A lamp that is just in the corner of a room with no light bulb is useless. All it is is taking up space. It's not performing the job that it was designed to do. Or when a lamp is put under a table and it only illuminates a certain part of the room. The light that we, that we reflect from Christ should be set on high, should be set on the highest part of our lives. And that is through example. That is when you think nobody else is watching you, that you live your life even though nobody's watching or so you think. that you live your life, that the only one that's watching, the only one that matters is Christ. And from there, you reflect that light. We need to be the light in a dark world. Amen? Amen. Because this, this world is ugly. It's dark right now, and it's getting worse. And it's going it's gonna to continue to get worse. The scripture says that this, is, this isn't it. This is just the beginning of the birth pain. So we need to be that light now more than ever. Pastor John Schwab's message last week was, was a good message. It was powerful. Amen. It was convicting. It convicted my heart. So we need to be the salt. We also need to be the light 
of this world. In John 1, it says in verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John's witness, the true light. Life, our life, represents light. It is no longer the same type of life anymore. The pilot has been turned on, and that flame burns fervently. Or it should. It should burn fervently. Because people live by examples, right? People live by comparison. People want to justify their sin by not being as bad as that guy. Well, at least I'm not doing that. Or at least I'm not involved in this. Sin is sin. And if our light dwindles down, if that knob on our flame gets turned down, whose fault is that? It's our own. It's our own. Whether it's, whether it's through the busyness of life or circumstances in your life that that pilot gets turned down, that's still your choice. The Lord will do everything he can to place people in your path to reignite that fire. So that to polish off that reflector so that you can shine bright. Because this world is so heavy that that reflector sometimes gets dirty. So it needs to be polished. When that light bulb goes out, it needs to be replaced so that light can shine. Everything in this world is a choice, brothers and sisters. Everything is a choice. It's a choice on who you're going to follow. It's a choice on what you're going to believe. It's a choice on who you're going to surround yourself with. And it's a choice on what kind of example you're going to set for the people that are looking in your life, into your life. Sometimes we like to set our light down low under the table and lowly, dimly light that room up. And what happens is, what, what that means is that when you put your light under something, so it doesn't shine the way it needs to shine, the way it's designed to shine. It's because we want to we wanna be close to the Lord, but yet live our own plan. Yet dabble in certain things we shouldn't. Because that's why we put that light under the table. Because when you're in sin, you don't want to be exposed. You prefer that darkness because you can't see. It's hard to see what you're doing. We need, to re we need to take that lamp, take it back out and put it on top of the highest table of your room so that your light shines bright for the Lord. I urge you, church, it's time to get serious. This world is not going to get any better. We need to quit playing games. And we need to set our lamp where it can be seen the way the Lord designed it. The Lord didn't do a work in your heart just to have you in the corner in the dark. No, he's going to say he saved you. He did that work in your heart because he's going to use you. He wants to use you. He wants to take you from this from this dark, dark place and set you where you can be seen. And believe me, the Lord has a way of sending you in places that you never thought you'd be to proclaim his name and proclaim
proclaim his glory. Amen. 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 I was talking to Pastor Harold this morning and, and, and Marcelo, and it reminded me of uh, Saul's conversion, the Apostle Paul. Saul was known for persecuting Christians. He was known for being present in the killing of Christians. So what Saul used to persecute the most, the Lord converted his heart. What he persecuted the most is what he ended up loving the most. And that was believers, Christians, believers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Do not allow the enemy to lie to you that you are of no purpose, or that you have no right for your light to shine for the Lord. Every one of us here has a light in us. Every one of us here has that reflector to reflect the Lord's light. So we need to do what we gotta do, whether it's to polish that reflector <coughs> so that your light shines bright. And you polish a reflector that if you walked away from the Lord, then you get right with the Lord. Not tomorrow, not next week, but now, today. That you come to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for not being that representative. Forgive me for not being that light. Forgive me, Lord, for not being that salt that preserves your word or that will Create thirst in somebody to continue to want to get to know you more. John 5.35 says, He was the burning and shining lamp, and you are willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's for the work which the Father has given to me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me. For the Father has sent me. Jesus continues to use the word light, lamp. What happens to a room when a dark room, when you turn on the light? It automatically, the, the, the darkness leaves, right? Light and dark do not create gray. The light overtakes the darkness. Amen. Amen? Amen. So it does not matter how dark a circumstance feels or appears. The light, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, is brighter than that. And will allow you to overcome the circumstance, the health issue, whatever it is. Verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So when I was studying for this and I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, okay, how can I present this? How can I present this in a way where my brothers and sisters can understand what it is, or what does it mean for the good works to be seen by men? For one, I don't want to, I didn't want to say, well, or contradict God's word and say, our Christian walk is not about works. It's not what you do that's going to get you into heaven. There's a difference between good works and good deeds or good things. When you do a good thing or a good deed, you're only glorifying yourself. You're letting people know that you are the one that helped 
in this situation and that you at least want to thank you. Or I appreciate it. Those are works of men. Those are good deeds. Those are good work, uh, good, good things. But good works is when the work gets done and our Lord gets the glory. When our Lord is glorified, when he's elevated, those are the good works that Jesus is talking about here. That whatever you do, that you don't do it to be recognized, but you do it to glorify God's name. Amen? Amen? When we go to the missions trip, you know, you can't help but wonder what people think about you when you're there serving. And I mean the locals. And I constant, I constantly have to tell myself for the Lord to remove that pride from me because it's easy to get prideful and receive a thank you from somebody. Like if, like if you're the one, you're the one that sent you to that missions trip. It's quite the contrary though. It's the Lord. The Lord gave you the ability to be there. It's the Lord's work. You're feeding the Lord's people. So good works. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. Not to receive a pat on the back. Not to receive recognition, but to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know sometimes that's easier said than done. Because being human, we all have that spirit of pride in us. And sometimes we leave it unchecked. We leave it unchecked. We're not constantly denying self. We're not constantly dying to self and picking up our cross and following him. We need to constantly be conscious of that. That in us, there's nothing good. In us, got us to where we're at. In addiction, in sin. That if we are left to ourselves, we would destroy ourselves. But in Christ, there's life. In Christ, there's light. And not only life for you, but life for those people that surround you, for your family members. Sometimes we don't understand the impact that we have on the people that surround us. We don't understand how people are looking into your life. Just by the way you do things by how committed you are to spending time with the Lord in the morning or in, in the afternoon or at lunchtime but not to not to show how how spiritual you are but you're upholding that covenant that you made to the Lord that you will always seek him and that we need to hear from him every day we can't just open our, our word on Monday and think that whatever the Lord gives us on Monday is going to be good for the rest of the week. Or don't think that only at church, when you come to a service, is when the Lord talks to you. Yes, he does talk to you at, on, on, through a message or through a Bible study. But the Lord also talks to you when you're in your word in your devotion time. And that is so that your reflector can be shined up so that you can magnify that light. So that salt can be, can be used for preserving, for purifying, for elevating the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Religion says, I obey. 
in order to be accepted. I obey in order to be accepted. The gospel says, I'm accepted, that is why I obey. I'm accepted, that is why I obey. I don't have to obey to be accepted. My obedience comes because I am accepted. Because of the work that the Lord did on that cross for us. He took all my sins, all your sins, and he paid the price. Think of it this way. The work that was done on the cross is like this. Here's your report card. And if your report card looked like mine when I went to school, it's pretty bad. D's, F's, 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 F's. You might get a C in there. Right? And then here's Jesus' report card. A plus, 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 and then some. What the Lord did on that cross was this. He gave his report card and did this. He took your F's, your D's, and he traded for your life. Amen? Amen? We should never forget that. God did not do a work. God did not start that work in your life for it to fade away, for it to be infected with the disease that this world has to offer. God did that work in your heart, in your life, so that it can be preserved forever, so that your light can shine forever until the last day you take your breath here or he comes back. Amen? Amen. A lot of churches, and I'm not talking about this one, a lot of Christians, and I'm not talking about you guys, but a lot of Christians walk around with their flame halfway lit. Or they put their lamp under the, under the table because they want to dabble in their sin but still say that they have a relationship with Christ. The church needs to get serious because the Lord's coming back. He's coming back sooner than we think. And we need to have our light shining bright before others. So there would be no doubt in our mind that if the Lord was to come today, right now in this instance, you know where your eternal address would be. That we have an attitude of, I know because I know. Instead of, uh, well, I need to get right with the Lord or... Give me some time. Let me work things out. Then I'll get right with the Lord. The day is today. So I want to encourage you guys that if you see or you know that your light is not as bright as it should be, shiny, I pray that you bring your heart to the Lord today. You bring your heart and you allow him to polish off that reflector, to reignite that pilot in your heart so that that flame burns fervently. So it burns bright and it burns hot. So that you be prepared for those good works, but not to glorify yourself, but to glorify him. Amen? Amen. I want to ask that if that if it's you if you are struggling in a certain area of your life and you know that you're not being as productive or that you're not being a good representative of the Lord that you that you raise your hand and that I can pray for you so that we could recommit and reignite that light that the Lord desires for us so that we can follow him close See you guys. See you, sister. See you, bro. Today is the day. Today is the day of the Lord. We need to quit procrastinating and putting things on the back burner because we don't know if we're promised tomorrow. Amen? Amen. 
I know you guys raise your hands. Can you please stand? Let me pray for you guys. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. You see the people here, Lord. You see the people that are, that are standing, Father. And you know their hearts, Lord. Father, the fact that they're here today is no accident, Lord. And you have a plan for each and every one of them, Lord, Father. And we understand, Lord. Sometimes we wander, Lord. Sometimes we get distracted, Father. But I pray, Lord, that you reignite every single heart here, Lord. Every heart that is standing up for you, Lord, in boldness, Father. I pray that you reignite that lamp, that light in their heart so that they could, they could follow you closer, Lord, so that the people around them, Lord, Father, can notice, can see, Lord, that there's something different about them. But not to glorify themselves, Lord, but to glorify you, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you do that work in their hearts, Lord, so that they could better serve you, Lord, Father. Because we don't, we don't know when you're coming back, but we know you're coming soon, Lord. So that they could know beyond the shadow of a doubt, Lord, where they were gonna, where they're gonna spend eternity, Lord. So I thank you for these people, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for allowing me to share. And remember, don't ever let the enemy let uh, lie to you that you're the only one that's going through something. Don't ever allow the enemy to lie to you to tell you that, you know what? You should be here already, and you're not. The Lord will meet you wherever you're at. So we need to stay obedient, and we need to stay faithful. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen. That's a good word. Let's stand up and...
Come back.